In the spirit of reconciliation, Alstonville Anglicans acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present. Yesterday, the death was announced of Bundilung elder Archie Roach, and his family have given permission to use his name to preserve his legacy. So we pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. <clears throat> A sentence of scripture. While we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. You please stand as we sing our first hymn, Breathe on Me breath of God.
Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favour of him, and he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called to him, called them to him, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so many among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The story <clears throat> that we heard from Matthew this morning begins with a contradiction of Mark's version of the same story. Whereas in Mark, James and John themselves asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hand, Matthew, in the reading that we heard just now, blames it on their mother. <laughs> Why the patriarchal interjection? Matthew, whoever he was, wrote at a time when the apostles were becoming notable and august figures. So it could be that rather than sully their names, Matthew chose to blame a woman. How typical. So we're, we'll go with Mark today, if you don't mind, whose narrative has two hot-headed disciples, appropriately named the sons of thunder, asking to sit at Jesus' right and left hand. And they thereby define themselves, not only as sons of thunder, but also as sons of their generation, of their culture, of their world. Their request is, in its essence, to occupy positions of power. They have not understood that the realm of God which Jesus heralds is one that rejects ambition and power and prominence and domination. Jesus' response to them implicitly refers to the hierarchical and oppressive power of the elite in the imperial world of the Roman Empire, whose domination was achieved by military power, taxation, and a remarkably small decision-making group that structured society for its own benefit. Hierarchies, power-grabbing, law-keeping, and a form of taxation similarly dominated the structures of Jewish society as they do in our own society today. Not much has really changed since then and now, including patriarchal interjections. Well, with this in mind, 
Let's take a look at Jesus' final words in Matthew's little story. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now this, of course, refers to Jesus' res death and resurrection. And as some of you know, I have some issues with the whole business of resurrection. But whatever one may make of resurrection, whether one views it as a physical reality, as a myth or metaphor, it does not matter a great deal in terms of the thrust and the depth of its meaning. Here, Jesus employs the term to express something about a new world with which he is associated and for which he yearns. A new way of living, as Stephen Sondheim's lyric in West Side Story so movingly put it. Now, on Friday I said similar words and discovered that nobody had heard of West Side Story. I was taken by a back, taken aback. I thought that was my generation. Yes? yes? So do you know the lyric of Sondheim's song? Or shall I read it to you? It's very short. Thank you, thank you, I want to. There's a place for us. I don't dare sing it. It's too high for me. Somewhere, a place for us. Peace and quiet and open air wait for us. Somewhere, there's a time for us. Someday, a time for us. Time together and time to spare. Time to learn, time to care. Someday, somewhere, we'll find a new way of living. We'll find a way of forgiving. Somewhere, there's a place for us, a time, a place for us. Hold my hand, and we're halfway there. Hold my hand, and I'll take you there. Somehow, someday, somewhere. That's pure gospel. Well, we are always as always, confronted with mystery when we weigh into such matters. The engineer in me wants hard facts, accurate analysis, tight solutions, and a nice boat to sail in at the end of it all. But such is not available in the realms of our persistently dualistic world. Let me step sideways for a moment into the world of the Pharisaic movement. The Pharisees were, in general, a very sincere bunch of people for whom adherence to the letter of the law was the path to salvation. Most views of Jesus' disputes with the Pharisees fail to appreciate the extent of its challenge to a dualistic understanding of good and evil, and hence a challenge to their moral imagination and to ours. As Sarah Bachelard has commented, Jesus criticizes not only the object of the Pharisees' moral concern, but also the very structure of their desire to do good. Now think about that. 
When the Pharisees test him on the law, he refuses the terms in which the questions are posed. And their framing of what is at stake presupposes the very conception of goodness and of God that Jesus is seeking to undo. Now, the nub of what I'm getting at here has to do with law. We often speak of the rule of the law, and frankly, I'm sick of politicians um, speaking of the rule of law and then breaking it. We speak of it as being fundamental to a decent democratic society. The imperial Roman Empire held similar ideals, and the Pharisaic movement almost grimly held to a rule of law as an article of salvation. But, as moral philosophers are wont to suggest, laws are implicitly dualistic in the sense that they demand an articulation of absolutes, right and wrong, good and bad, light and dark, and so on. And the trouble with such systems is that we human beings come to define our very selves and each other by the same absolute precepts. And inevitably, we fail to measure up to our own standards. The dualistic nature of a rule of law defeats its own purpose. Now the radical thing about Jesus is that he subverts this dualism of dividing the world into good and bad, righteous and unrighteous. Jesus understands God to be unconcerned with our division of each other into such categories. For as Matthew rightly reports, God makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and saying, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Furthermore, as we know, he refuses to allow himself to be designated as good. Why call me good? Jesus says to the rich man, no one is good but God alone. Jesus is not simply proposing a new principle of moral life, a new norm of judgment within which alter uh, an alternative system of goodness. He's making available a far way, deeper way of being good. A totally new way of living. A graceful way of living, one might say. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once remarked that the humanity of God, the humanity God loves and becomes in Christ, is not an ideal human, but human beings as they are, not in an ideal world, but in a real world. And since real human beings are alienated from God and from each other, that is the humanity that Jesus takes on. So to quote again Sarah Bachelard, God does not just love us as we are, but daringly God becomes who we are. To which I would add, and we become who God is. As Maria Skobstava put it, I think I gabbled about this um, Last June it would be, I think, not long ago. She said that all persons in the world are icons, that is, true images of God, 
that have the holiness of the living God within them. And I dare say that could be the most concise expression of the gospel that I know in which there's an ineffable harmony, the harmony of the Holy Trinity. There is a place for us. So be it. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for peace in the world. <clears throat> holy Spirit, holy breath, fire of love, sweetest taste beautiful aroma. Fill the hearts of the leaders of the nations and those in authority. Let us pray for the welfare of the church. Holy Spirit, forgiving and giving, uniting strangers reconciling enemies, seeking the lost, and circling people together. Fill this church with the worldwide church with unity. Let us pray for the earth. Holy Spirit, raining from clouds, filling rivers and sea. Fill the earth from the heights to the depths with renewal. Let us pray for those in need. Holy Spirit, comforting fire, life of all creation, anointing the sick, cleansing the body and soul. Fill the bodies of the aged and infirm, the sick and the lonely, the bereaved and the suffering. Now come a time of absolution and confession. Tenderness of your grace. Give to us, O breath of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God, and the purpose of God, to do on earth as is done in heaven, in the name of wisdom, love, and grace. Amen. Amen. Let us confess together. Create a clean heart Amen. within, within me, me, O God. God so that, that it may, may become your chosen shelter and the Amen. resting place of the Holy Spirit. I make Amen. the cross of Christ upon my breast, over the tablet of my heart, and I beseech the living God of the universe, may the light of lights come to my heart, so that I may live in the power of your love. And may we stand for the peace. I love the face of God in you. I love the face of God in you. And God's peace be with you. And also with you. <clears throat> peace be with you, Charlie. Thank you.
a final blessing. The wisdom of God, the love of God, and the grace of God strengthen you always to be Christ's hands and hearts in this world. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep you in the knowledge and love of God, and the blessing of God, source of all, love made flesh in Christ, and breath of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the bond of love, be on you always.